time for On Target Radio, Chicagoland's only radio show dedicated to educating, entertaining, and discussion of firearms, legislation, and your Second Amendment rights. Presented in part by the Illinois State Rifle Association, Illinois Gun Works, Peltrier's Shooting Supply, and Safer USA. Now here's your host, firearm instructor, educator, and enthusiastic Second Amendment proponent, David Lombardo. And welcome to On Target Radio, America's voice for the Second Amendment. I'm David Lombardo, and my co-host, Tim Dalen, across the council. Say hi, Tim. Hello, David. Yeah, it never works out the way I plan. Every uh, Works out every, the way I plan every time. <laughs> every Sunday, we'll be here from 9 to 10 p.m. Uh, talking about all things Second Amendment. And uh, you'll have the opportunity to call in and talk to our guests. Uh, I have a froggy voice this evening, so I was kind of hoping that uh, the cough button would be a pedal on the floor, but... <laughs> If you hear uh, horrific grunts and snorts, it's, I'm losing my voice. I don't know why. It is what it is. Anyway, uh, that'll be your opportunity uh, to call and talk to our guests. We'll take questions or comments at 312-642-5600. 312-642-5600. Or go to Facebook, like our page on Target Radio, and ask a question there. Uh, this week, Tim, this will crush you, but I don't have a rant of the week. Ah, uh, I thought that would get some sort of a response, uh, because we have some pithy subjects to discuss before we get to our our guests. As you know, this Wednesday, uh, March 6th, is iGold. iGold, you gotta go. Illinois Gun Owners Lobby Day, and it will uh, be at, it starts at 1045. Yes. Wednesday morning at the uh, Prairie Capital Convention Center. Free, doesn't cost a single dime for any of the events down there, you just have to get there. You just got to get there. There'll be a legislative briefing. There'll be a giant march to the Capitol, not in step. It's, but, you know, kind of a a herd sort of thing. And, uh, and sort of a meander. Yeah. And you get to talk to your representative, which uh, in past years we've uh, gotten uh, around 7,000. Yes. The last three years are around 7,000, a little bit over, a little bit less. And we're pushing this year. Yeah. We got to. Everybody that's listening, you know what's going on down in Springfield. You know what they tried to pull over on us during the lame duck session in January and what they're trying to do to us now. And uh, concealed carry is very popular right now. Everybody wants it. We all want it. So we need to go down there and make our voices heard. So we're hoping everyone turns out. If you are a pro second amendment person, this is the most important Wednesday of your Illinois life. The next Saturday, Tim and I will be teaching home protection concealed carry at the American Legion hall in West Chicago uh, from 8 a.m. to 4 so uh, go to our website. You can sign up for Home Protection Concealed Carry. That morning, Tim will, will be kicking the football by himself early, and I will be speaking at West Suburban Patriots Breakfast. The attendance at that is free. Uh, there's a nominal... Nominal? A nominal... No, I did it again. There's a small charge for breakfast. It's at the Wheaton Bowl Banquet Room, 2031 North Gary Avenue in Wheaton. Wheaton Bowl Banquet Room. Yeah, it's hard to say. Wheaton Bowl Banquet yes. Room. Uh, 2031 North Gary Avenue in Wheaton. 9 a.m. is the start time. I will be there. Uh, I, I will talk on whatever people want. We can talk about concealed carry. We can talk about assault weapon ban. We can talk about home invasion. You got me for an hour or so. So, And then I'll go back and I'll uh, join Tim. Right. And we were at the DuPage County Gun Show today. And it was a great time. We were there all day, talked to a lot of people, a lot of listeners. So anybody that's on right now, thank you for stopping by and saying hi. And speaking of a lot of listeners, uh, the last little item of business before we get in is uh, we have the opportunity to pick up a second hour on this show. And we would very much like to do that. We'd like to cover more hard news. So if you have been considering uh, becoming a sponsor, now is the time. Shameless advertisement. Shameless. Now is the time to do it. Uh, We're hitting about 10,000 people per show and so at, uh, at our advertising rate, you're looking about one cent per contact. It's the best radio advertising buy you can make. So now is the time if you want to do it. We really would like to uh, pick up a second hour if at all possible. Okay, so tonight we're going to be talking about hunting and conservation. And uh, our guests are Dave Harrison, resource conservationist from Whiteside County Soil and Conservation uh, District. Uh, Dave, thank you for coming. Good evening, Dave and Tim. Appreciate that. Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, Scott Schaefer with the Illinois Department of Natural Resource. He's a wildlife biologist. Thank Pleasure to be coming. here, Dave. Thank you. Appreciate that. And Mike has been on before. Mike Jacobson owns Hilltop Meadows Hunt Club in what town is it? Uh, 
Bolton, Illinois. There you go. Bolton out west. Somewhere that way. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be talking about hunting and conservation this evening. And I just want to start off with a question that has always kind of gotten me. Flyways. We, we sit pretty much under a flyway in this area. Why is that? What makes it a flyway? Well, in this case, in, in, in Illinois, we're part of the Mississippi Flyway. And there are four of them. There's the Mississippi, the Central, the Pacific, and the Atlantic. And it, it represents concentrated passages of waterfowl from the breeding grounds to the north to the wintering grounds to the south. That's sort of the simplified version. So are they just following the water? Well, there are corridors that lead into the main flyway, you know, what we call flyway corridors, obviously. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a, a good place to do census work, conduct surveys, to do waterfall uh, conservation type projects because they are frequented by, you know, uh, migrating waterfowl. Which brings up the question, you, you actually can count not just waterfowl, which you can but deer and all kinds of things, you can actually count them. How, how do you even do that? Well, there, there's all kinds of, uh, depending on the species, the game species that we're monitoring at the time, but we, we use aerial uh, fixed wing and helicopter aircraft for, for conducting censuses. We do ground counts. We do, uh, for example, in the spring, we do uh, what's called an audio count where we stop every mile and listen for three minutes and, and listen for every cock pheasant that crows or a quail that might whistle. And we jot that down on our data sheet and you run the same 20 mile census route every spring. So you get a representation of what that population is doing. Is it up? Is it down? And then correlate that with some things such as land use or, or winter weather or things like that. We can come up with just an index of abundance. That's all we need to know is what that population is doing. We don't need to know exactly how many pheasants are out there. We just need to have an index number. And then, of course, we parlay that with hunting seasons and harvest quotas and that sort of thing. But when you're flying in an aircraft, and let's take um, maybe deer as an example, because it's a fairly good-sized animal. I mean, you, you, you fly over an area and you go, one, two, three. I mean, li- how can you possibly do that? Well, we have people that are experienced. My, I, my, right. my, I've done some smaller uh, deer counts out of, a, of an aircraft, but we have people that have years of experience doing that. And you get the knack of it, and, and you get a, a picture uh, of a, a parameter, if you will, of, of, a, of, a, of a window of where you're censusing. And then you, you look at the number of waterfowl that usually fits that window, say if it's 75 or 100. And if that window is half full, then you know you're somewhere around 50. And you extrapolate that window to the, t- the entire target area, and you come up with a, a pretty accurate count. Uh, but the exact you know, census recipe, if you will, depends on the species that you're counting. So what we're looking for, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what we're looking for is the amount of habitat. And we know for a given species, it takes X amount of habitat to support it, right? Right. And so we're looking for how many of a given herd or flock are in this area, and is there enough land to support them? Yes, that's a good point, Dave. And we also monitor the habitat changes, and, and we, you know, interface that with the with the uh, the number of birds or deer or whatever we, we've censused, and we can come up with a harvestable surplus, and then fit that into a hunting season framework. So these game species are highly regulated, they're highly monitored, and and can safely be removed. Uh, the other way, I, I when people ask me about hunting seasons and and harvest quotas and how we manage game species. The other thing I often uh, mention is these are renewable resources, just like corn and cows and fruit trees, and and, and they have a harvestable surplus uh, that will be replaced given that they have enough breeding habitat to to fall back on. And we can safely, you know, in the the name of good stewardship, we can safely harvest uh, those species. And I believe it would be fair to say that the the amount of habitat is shrinking, is it not? Every time somebody builds a house somewhere on an empty lot, we, we lose habitat, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, a pothole gets drained, you know, a road gets built, house gets built. It shrinks the habitat base down. And it's, it's a problem in you know, all of northern Illinois. Southern Illinois, you know, the pressure isn't quite as bad. Northern Illinois, it's terrific pressure. It's not just the uh, uh, the amount of habitat either, but the quality. Quality, of habitat. right? Well, and that's the other thing. So I would assume when there's no rain, like last summer, we had a really dry summer. Right. That's going to affect the habitat too. Yeah, you know, wetlands. A lot of wetlands that 
you know, may have water in them through June or July by, you know, the end of May were dry. And, you know, that's one less pothole for, you know, a brood to, uh, you know, grow up on. That's that much less food, you know. So, yeah, the quality habitat has to be regulated also. You know, a, a grassland field isn't just a grassland field. You know, you could have bluegrass out there. That may not have the same quality as a stand a little blue stem. In terms of nutrient? Well, not necessarily just nutrient, but the type of cover. You know, they, you know, if it's a quail, little blue stem's heaven, you know. Uh, regular lawn grass is, you know, it's it's not very good. So, well, it's it's a it's a very intricate weave of different factors that right. go into play. And uh, when we come back, we're I'd like to just talk a little bit about why we do that. What the, what's the the onerous problem that results if we don't? And we'll be back uh, after these messages with more on Target Radio. This podcast is featured on the Gun Rights Radio Network podcasting freedom you can hear gun rights radio network on stitcher smart radio stitcher allows you to listen to your favorite shows directly from your iphone android phone blackberry or palm phones on demand and on the go don't have stitcher download it for free today at stitcher.com or in the app stores stitcher smart radio the smarter way to listen to radio gun rights radio network shows can be found under sources Hi, I'm David Lombardo, host of On Target Radio. You're living proof that radio advertising reaches listeners. In the two years I've been advertising on AM560 WIND, Safer USA grew from 300 students a year to over 1,200. By coupling our On Target Radio broadcast with our Facebook page, we found our audience is steadily growing, and in only two months, it appears we've exceeded 5,000 listeners. Over 34% are in the age group 25 to 34, 26% are 35 to 44. We have listeners from Rock to Western Michigan and Southern Wisconsin to St. Louis. Thanks to live streaming on the internet, we also have listeners as far away as Germany, Japan, and New Zealand. On Target Radio is offering low-cost sponsorship opportunities on Chicago's premier conservative talk radio station. Advertising on AM 560 WIND has worked for Safer USA. Let me show you how it can work for you. Call 815-744-5487. Join the On Target Radio team today at 815-744-5487. Five four eight seven. You're listening to On Target Radio on AM five sixty. The answer with David Lombardo. Here's David with more interesting conversation on firearms, safety, your Second Amendment rights, and much more. And we're back with On Target Radio. We're talking about hunting and conservation. Our guests are uh, Dave Harrison, resource conservationist from uh, Whiteside County uh, Soil and Conservation District. Scott Schaefer with the IDNR. He's a wildlife biologist, and Mike Jacobson, and now an old friend of ours uh, from uh, Hilltop Meadows Hunt Club. I have a question, Scott. When when we uh, before we went to uh, break, we talked about um, about what happens with crowding, and I want to get into that. But before I do, before I do, I didn't forget you, Tim. <laughs> yes, before you did. Yeah, I did. Actually, you, I did. You, I'm, I'm you saw me. Up. You saw me pointing one of my fingers okay, at true. you. This is radio. People aren't supposed to know that. (laughs) Go ahead. Do your thing. This is Fighting Back, brought to you by the Illinois State Rifle Association. A Hickory, North Carolina man is grateful to be alive after he says an intruder broke down his front door and tried to beat him and rob him. Paul Oley said he was in his kitchen around 9 a.m. when he heard his front door being kicked in. The intruder called for help initially, but as Oley reached for his phone, the man wrestled it out of his hands. He put me in a headlock and drove me to the floor, said Oley. As the two men wrestled, the homeowner, in fighting back, reached for a single-shot shotgun he keeps by the door. The intruder grabbed it from him and beat him with it. Ole now has nearly a dozen staples on the top and side of his head where he was beaten. I was fighting for my life, he said. Ole said he finally broke free, ran to his bedroom where he grabbed a revolver and shot the man to death. Hickory, uh, Hickory police say no charges have been filed. This is Fighting Back, brought to you by the Illinois State Rifle Association. For over 100 years, the Illinois State Rifle Association has supported the rights and freedoms of Illinois citizens to keep and bear arms. For over 100 years, the ISRA has supported the use of firearms as a sport for personal protection and as a fundamental aspect of national defense. For over 100 years, the Illinois State Rifle Association has been supporting you. Don't you think it's time you supported them? ISRA.org or 815-635-3198. That's 815 815- 635-3198. The Illinois State Rifle Association, supporting you. And please, come to iGold Wednesday. 
uh, will be there. Dave uh, will be up in the front of the room. I'll be filtering around through the back. Uh, this will be my eighth year in a row there. I'll be up in the front of the room. I'm emceeing the, the guests yes. and the speakers. Yeah. So, you know, you're there for a great cause, but, you know, if you don't like Dave, you can bring a tomato or two. That's all right. We'll let you. Okay, time to get back to our guest, the tomato-less guest. Uh, so, before I was so, I won't say rudely interrupted, before I flubbed and forgot Tim exists, I was about to ask Scott. The issue behind conservation, when we're talking about overcrowding, overpopulation, the issue is if you overpopulate the habitat with the species, it causes problems. Like what? Well, what you're alluding to there is what, what biologists like to call uh, carrying capacity. And, and given any time and space, there's a finite amount of food, water, and what I like to call living space available to a select number of species in a quantifiable amount of habitat. And usually uh, through reproduction, especially in the prey species that were, you know, most of our game species are, are considered prey species, there's a surplus. And if that habitat can only support 75 deer, let's say, just for the sake of uh, our discussion here, and there's 100 of them going into the winter, 25 of those are in excess. So if we don't harvest that and bring the amount of deer and the herd down into balance of what the habitat can support, then Mother Nature will do it for us in terms of starvation or, or, you know, ease of uh, disease spread, predation, whatever the case may be. So, you know, we we have this harvest. That's In the earlier segment, that's what I was referring to in terms of a harvestable surplus. That's based on a, a quantifiable number of game species a select amount of habitat can support. So uh, it, it, it fits in with this renewable resource, and, and, and uh, it, it, hunting is by far less cruel way, if you will, of removing that surplus than uh, some of these other mortality Starving factors. Death. Right, exactly. And it also will lead to, because you have less food source, that lowers the resistance of the animals or the flock or whatever and leads to disease then, does Ex- it not? That's an excellent point, Dave. Uh, if we keep... The uh, the game species at, at what we the carrying capacity we actually the the abbreviated uh, version of that is what we call K. If we can keep a species at K or slightly below, there's perhaps an excess amount of resources available to those individual animals. There's more food, so they're far more healthier, and they can ward off these different diseases and these different pathogens that you were talking about. So that's a good point, uh, and hunting fits right into that. We I know we talked before the show about the. Uh subject of chronic wasting and right. i and i i just think we have a, a lot of hunters and and we should probably say something about that and is that not a direct result of, of at least partially habitat issues well it it does tend to manifest itself in places where there is a lot of high deer densities um we found where uh we have what we call a spark that's a that's a, an area that we did not have any uh, CWD detected, and we all of a sudden have one, our first one. We call that a spark. And invariably, it seems to pop up where we have, comparatively speaking anyway, high deer densities. So in terms of, of managing a herd and keeping it at K, at carrying capacity, you could make an argument that it would help keep CWD at bay. So that, yes, that's, again, I'm, I'm falling back on hunting, and it helps us achieve that goal. Has that not, it's all through the Midwest now, right? Right. It came, did it come down from the north? We, we think we got our infection from the north. Um, it's been in Colorado for a number of years, Wyoming for a number of years, and then it, the first state in the Midwest that had it was Wisconsin. Uh, and in, they have two infections. The Mount Horeb infection is the one that's closest to us, and their prevalence rates are in some around 20, 22 uh, percent, which is significant. Our prevalence rates are somewhere around 2 percent. Uh, but, again, we've been pretty aggressive trying to hold CWD at bay through some of our, our, our projects and our programs, working with the hunters, liberalizing permits in uh, counties where we have CWD. Can you eat that meat? Yes. They, we recommend if it if we have a, uh, a sample taken and it comes back positive, we recommend that you don't eat that meat. You know, you wouldn't want to eat a sick animal just in general. But we can't trace any human health uh, problems to, to CWD at this point. Okay. 
it's it's a problem that can be solved somehow some at some point or that's, no no that's, no. that's, that's we, a big went, question it's, it's always <laughs> fatal and it's highly contagious right. and really? it's got it's got people who manage deer herds uh, natural resource people extremely worried mm-hmm and, it could uh, ultimately wipe out the population. I mean, extrapolate it out far enough. Yeah. yeah, going unchecked without the control measures. Yeah, it's very possible. Right. So, which brings me to the question: Do you, do you not, as conservationists, have uh, like species plans? Can you talk a little? We got about two minutes. Can you talk a little bit about what does that mean? Well, basically, when someone comes into our office, either a you know a state, federal, or private landowner. A lot of times what they have in mind is increasing game numbers on their property. We try to determine, you know, what's on the property, doing a quick census, and then develop, you know, plants, uh, prairie plants, forested plants, trees, whatever, you know, depending on the game, to increase those numbers. Um, you know, it's, it depends on the species. We try not to single species manage if we can. Um, and we put out a, you know, very diverse habitat out there that's going to benefit a number of species both game and non-game uh you know we use the crp program a lot uh scott has a program wildlife uh, acres for wildlife which is a private lands program uh i try to bring in private donations also to help the landowners out through ducks unlimited wild uh, fall usa uh, pheasants forever uh, so we try to bring in a lot of different resources to help those landowners out to achieve their goals. Do you work in conjunction with people like Mike who have, have clubs like that? Sure. Is that all part of the picture? Oh, it's been yeah, a, a exactly. big impact on our uh, habitat. I've worked with both these fellows, and uh, it's an ongoing project. It's nothing that happens overnight, but you see results immediately. And even if we're just trying to uh, improve habitat for pheasants, uh, for instance, it, it uh, helps a lot of other species as well. Yeah, I think the thing to keep in mind, Dave, is a lot of the money that's raised and a lot of the tax dollars that are used are, you know, come from the sale of licenses. So then there's a lot of non-game species that are benefiting from those hunting dollars. You know, there's a percentage of that money from ammunition sales, gun sales, archery equipment. All goes to, A percentage of it goes back to wildlife. And, you know, that's helping a chickadee as well as a ringneck pheasant. So, you know, those are the people that say hunting's bad – Cut that money out and let's see what happens to the chickadee populations. You know, well, it's going to have an effect. And the people who say hunting is bad typically are city dwellers who move out, buy five acres of land, take up habitat, pour concrete on it, right. and then complain because there's coyotes bothering their dog. Yeah. Yeah. That just drives me nuts. I go crazy over that. Go back to Chicago. Right. You know. <laughs> anyway, we're going to be back uh, after a few more messages with more On Target Radio. You're listening to AM560, The Answer. If you own firearms or are considering ownership, Illinois Gunworks is Chicagoland's full-service firearm headquarters. From void services and new firearm purchases to gunsmith services and indoor shooting range, the staff at Illinois Gunworks will assist you without attitude or pressure. Need training? Illinois Gunworks offers the popular Illinois Responsible Firearms Owners Class that will teach you the regulations to legally defend yourself, own, and transport your firearm. There's the required class for Chicago Firearm Permit and popular new shooter familiarization class including one for women only. Illinois Gunworks offers a wide selection of training and certification classes from security work to those just considering ownership, even special group classes. Illinois Gunworks, Chicagoland's full-service firearm headquarters, is on Grand Avenue, just a block west of Harlem and Elmwood Park. Call 708-452-0040 or visit IllinoisGunworks.com. That's 708-452-0040 or log on to IllinoisGunworks.com. Hi, I'm David Lombardo, host of On Target Radio. You're living proof that radio advertising reaches listeners. In the two years I've been advertising on AM560 WIND, Safer USA grew from 300 students a year to over 1,200. By coupling our On Target Radio broadcast with our Facebook page, we found our audience is steadily growing, and in only two months, it appears we've exceeded 5,000 listeners. Over 34% are in the age group 25 to 34, 26% are 35 to 44. 
We have listeners from Rockford to Western Michigan and Southern Wisconsin to St. Louis. Thanks to live streaming on the internet, we also have listeners as far away as Germany, Japan, and New Zealand. On Target Radio is offering low-cost sponsorship opportunities on Chicago's premier conservative talk radio station. Advertising on AM 560 WIND has worked for Safer USA. Let me show you how it can work for you. Call 815-744-5487. Join the On Target Radio team today at 815-744-5487. You're listening to On Target Radio on AM 560. The Answer with David Lombardo. Here's David with more interesting conversation on firearms, safety, your Second Amendment rights, and much more. Welcome back to On Target Radio. Uh, go to our Facebook page, like On Target Radio, and question, ask us a question there. We'll be happy to answer it. Or call us at 312-642-5600. We're talking about hunting and conservation uh, this evening. And the question that uh, I would like to bring up, we we talked about the the whole issue of uh, of habitat and and how that uh, leads to sickness and and that sort of thing what is right now the most pressing habitat issue what what one thing are we is there or is there even one thing that we're well, worried about it depends where you're at dave if you're in a forested you know environment or a forested soil situation it's either going to be the lack of trees or if you have a existing woodland it's the condition and the quality of that woodland if you're in a flat area that's got wet holes it's probably lack of grass and winter cover uh you know our pheasant populations have plummeted in this state and it's you know it goes right back to the lack of grass cover was that clear cutting uh, actually clear cutting isn't all bad depending on the species and what you're trying to achieve uh, yeah, if you're up in northern Wisconsin and you're trying to get a viable grouse population, clear cutting's the answer. Did it not, didn't it affect the pheasant population, though? Well, pheasants are more of a grassland species. It's the lack of hay in crop rotations. There's more row crops, uh, fewer fence rows. Uh, you know, uh, things like giant ragweed seeds vitally important, and it's a really great seed for food, for wildlife. With the type of farming we have now, you know, that's virtually been eliminated. So, you know, it's all the whole landscape matrix has changed, you know, since I've been around. You know, I I grew up in the 60s and early 70s. I could walk out my back door and harvest a brace of pheasants and maybe kick up two or three rabbits and a covey of quail. I challenge anybody to do that anymore in Illinois. Yeah. I when I got to the army, I went to University of Illinois in Champaign and I got there in January of 70. And back in those days, liability wasn't what it is now. Right. You could walk a railroad track; nobody yep. cared. They didn't. That didn't. Buy, and you could you could get anything. Right. And I mean, that just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. Nineteen sixty three, we harvested one point two million mm-hmm. pheasants. Uh, this year, we will harvest less than twenty seven thousand. Wow. In that's, the state of that's Illinois. Astounding. Yeah, and usually the only pheasant populations you're going to find in, well, at least in our neck of the woods out west here, is the CRP acres. Uh, otherwise, there's nothing there for them. You know, I, I like to refer to it, and I'm probably going to get some of my farmer friends just mad at me, <laughs> but the black desert. You know, you look out there, and there's nothing. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that uh, pheasant uh, number that you mentioned, is that also counting Farm-raised pheasants that are re- just wild pheasants. Wild, just wild. Yeah. 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 wild pheasants. Which then does bring this issue up. I, I mean, I'm sure, Mike, you subscribe to good conservation in your in your facility. W- what about the average just homeowner? Somebody buys five acres out in the country. What could they be doing to help the problem? Well, I think by putting in good quality habitat, even on a small acreage like that, you know, of you know, shelter belt planting with evergreens and shrubs, maybe a small plot of native grass, a food plot. You know, it would be amazing how fast you would attract wildlife to that if you took just an average open lot and put those components in. I have uh, about uh, on a little less than half an acre. I, mm-hmm. I live in the southwest suburbs, but we're right by the uh, DuPage River. Sure. And there's a big buck. You know, he's like a pet, but and about a half a dozen does. Right. And they just they don't even jump my four foot fence. They just <laughs> step over it and they come through the yard. And I got a bunch of pines. I got some right. pines and stuff. And they kind of hang out for a while. Right. And then 
move on. Yeah, I, it, when I do CRP, especially with wetlands, and it rever- you know relates back to your small acreage, I like to do something called a string of pearls, where instead of just one landowner, I try to contact several landowners. So there's like a contiguous block of habitat, sure. but on different landowners. Mm-hmm. So the animals have a variety of places they can go to. And usually there's a variety of plants on those, so they can feed, they can breed, raise their broods there too. And that's the thing. If you can talk to your neighbors and get a, almost like a co-op going, that goes a long way. Has, uh, has Turkey rebounded the last 10, 12, 15 oh, years? Oh, incredibly so. I, I know I moved to this state. Uh, I'm not from Illinois. Mm-hmm. I moved here in 94. I had never seen a wild turkey. I saw one at uh, uh, down at a state park down south. Mm-hmm. And uh, now it seems like if you drive, especially I go down the Kankakee River, you'll see them just every farm field. You'll see a, a flock of, flock, is that right? Right. Mm-hmm. Flock, right. Of, flock of turkeys, 10, 20 or more, all yeah. over the place. Yeah, Scott was involved in the, some of the original uh, trapping and relocation of them, too. It, we we got uh, about 30 seconds left. Mark asked a question on Facebook. He said, what percentage of license revenue is directed to conservation in Illinois? The licenses that in Illinois are 100%, but the Pittman-Robertson, how does that work? Well, that's an excise tax, when, uh, tax rather, when you buy a, uh, a firearm or a box of shells or some archery tax, uh, we get a percent of that back from the federal government, and it's based on... Uh, your license sales and your population. So that gets put back into fish and game conservation as well. So the more licenses and more sporting goods you buy, the better we can do for uh, for game. Do we have any sense, do sportsmen support 100% of conservation? Does that kind of money actually support it? Oh, tremendously. It does. About 90,000 jobs in the state of Illinois are associated with outdoor recreation. Somewhere around $32 billion in economic activity is associated with fishing and hunting. It's incredibly important. Okay, we'll be back with more On Target Radio after these messages. For 35 years, Pelcher's Shooter's Supply has served the Lansing area. Pelcher's offers new and used firearm sales, appraisals, and gunsmithing service. Pelcher's new spacious showroom has hundreds of major brand firearms and supplies, and PelcherGuns.com features daily specials. Pelcher's Shooter's Supply, on the corner of Ridge Road and Henry Street in downtown Lansing. Online at P-E-L-C-H-E-R-Guns.com or call 708-474-0666. You're listening to On Target Radio on AM560, The Answer, with David Lombardo. Here's David with more interesting conversation on firearms, safety, your Second Amendment rights, and much more. Uh, Javier asked uh, on Facebook, and you missed it, he said, uh, did I hear you were going to have a second hour? Which uh, wonderfully puts us right into, again, saying... We are looking for more sponsors because we have an opportunity to add a second hour, but we need more sponsors. So, Javier, if you have, you know, an extra few hundred bucks a week, let us know, okay? Uh, Mike, you are a private property owner. You have a club. And so is there state or federal funds or help or something that helps you deal with that? Oh, there's a lot. We're in the, um, we have 355 acres, 220 of which is in the Conservation Reserve Program. 180 acres in grasslands and 40 acres in wooded areas. So what do they do for you? They give me money. (laughs) Well, that helps, doesn't it? Yes. Not a lot, but uh, not a lot of money, but not as much as you could uh, get by farming some of this ground. But it's marginal farm ground to begin with. So we're doing we're accomplishing a lot of a lot of different things here. We're uh, preserving our soils and we're creating great habitat for wildlife. So it's not money that you go to Acapulco with in the winter. It's money that you actually put into the land. I call it beer money. <laughs> See, that was <laughs> it, it, that it, was not a good answer. It, 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 I'm just saying it's not a huge amount of money yeah. because we do spend it all putting it right back into our conservation efforts. And uh, Dave Harrison uh, from Soil and Water Conservation District, he administers a lot of these programs where he helps the landowners get into these conservation reserve programs. Um, so he's got all the... I've got all the technical. answers. He's got all the technical <laughs> aspects of it. But it doesn't restrict so get, you're no. using the property, no, right? We can, we, can, no. we can hunt on it. And the other thing is that I've heard people say that I think is wrong, and that is you don't have to let like just strangers walk no. on your property no. and hunt. No. No. no, you still control the trespass rights, and you pay the taxes on it. Right. So. 
But so, we can't do just anything we want with the property. There right. are rules. I mean, you couldn't put a road through there. No, I'm and sorry. I, I didn't mean it that You couldn't build on it. Yeah. Uh, it's, for, it's for conservation. It's for conservation only. Right. But what they're doing is the state is helping you, but not saying that you are required to let hunters come into the land that correct. you don't know. That's correct. Yeah. And the object, I assume, is to build up a mass, as much land as possible, to sustain the different species. Well, exactly. It, yeah, that's one thing. And the other thing is, you know, the original intent of the CRP program or the Conservation Reserve, which Mike's involved in, um, was soil erosion. And it's branched out into just a fantastic wildlife program. In fact, nationwide, it's probably one of the best wildlife programs we've got to work with right really? now. Really? Yes. Um, it benefits the landowner and they get a payment. benefits wildlife, of course, because it brings habitat in. Uh, and it benefits society in general because there's more animals out there. Even if you don't hunt or fish, there, you can bird watch, whatever, you know. I, you know, I, I want to emphasize that one more time. It's game and non-game species benefit. Sure. It's not just pheasants that are being produced out there. Yeah. Uh, Don uh, on Facebook asked, why is it that uh, that hunters and conservationists aren't as active in Second Amendment issues, that things that are going on, as, say, like competitive shooters? We don't, we don't hear as much from, from hunters and conservationists. I... I don't know. I, that's a good question. That's a great question, in fact. I don't know, Scott. Maybe you have an opinion on it more so than I. I, I you know, that, that is an excellent question. Uh, the, I guess the marriage between uh, hunting and, and firearms has is, is, is got a lot of history, rich history to it, and it's, it's, it's obvious, it's real. Um, but in terms of uh, just people that enjoy shooting, uh, perhaps that's a call to arms, if you will. Yeah. We, they need to get uh, more vocal and, and involved. Well, Scott, I mean, Scott, it is. The problem, the problem has always been that, and I don't want to get off on this because I want to talk about the farm bill real quickly, but the problem has always been divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. The, the anti-Second Amendment people will say, well, you know, what about trappers? You don't need them. So they, we pick those guys off. I get yeah, and then and then after they get them, well, these muzzleloader guys, you know, we don't, you know what I'm saying? Right. And hunters are part of the program. They need to they need to jump in on it. But that's another show. I do want to ask you about the farm bill because this is sure. a big deal. Uh, yeah, the farm bill. I that's my primary job anymore. I'd say ninety percent of what I do is working with the farm bill programs. Um, you know, similar to what Mike's doing out there, he's actually got two programs. He's got the Conservation Reserve Program and the Equip Program that's helped him out with cost share in the wooded areas that aren't or weren't farmed. Um, but the Farm Bill, you know, if you want to get excited about something and you hunt and fish, you should get excited about the Farm Bill. You know, you should call your uh, senator, call your legislator, and tell them to support a strong Farm Bill and fully fund the CRP program. You know, if, like I said, that's the best or one of the best habitat tools we have right now, CRP. And without that, you, you think you got bad populations now. Pull CRP and see what happens. What will the Farm Bill actually do for you? Well, there's a conservation title in the Farm Bill. And what that covers is soil erosion compliance, wetland or swamp buster compliance, compliance. Ooh, it's getting late. And the CRP program and several other programs, too, like the Wetland Reserve Program, to create wetlands and keep them under an easement into perpetuity. And without that, that's, you know, like a mechanic trying to work without wrenches. You know, I'm not going to say we completely close our programs down, but it would certainly hurt them. I hear from a lot of uh, people, goose hunters specifically, why is there even a limit on geese? I mean, people are getting so fed up with geese taking over neighborhoods and, and stuff. I mean, basically, people are going, geese are rats with wings. Why don't we just have open season year-round? Well, we have made some strides in managing geese. We used to have quotas, you know, quota zones, and now we just have a season. Um, there's a daily bag, of course, but uh, we're it... it Geese are, believe it or not, since they do cross political boundaries, are managed by the federal government. And that'd be the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Sure, sure they're migratory. And, right. And so you, you don't have to have a lot of imagination to, to, to figure in politics. And, and then all the states in the particular flyway that we talked about earlier compete for that resource and a piece of that harvest. So you get this, you know, competing friction. And, and But we have made some strides and we'll, we'll get there. And uh, that will take us into the break. We'll be back. 
I'm David Lombardo, president of Safer USA, Chicagoland's most popular firearm training school. We continue to offer our popular home protection and concealed carry seminar every month. This eight-hour seminar covers everything you need to know to safely and legally use a firearm for both concealed carry and home invasion and qualifies you for Florida and Utah concealed carry permits good in about 30 states. Be sure to call and ask how we can help you raise funds for your organization or provide a guest speaker. We're also offering the NRA Basic Pistol Course and our Tactical Pistol 1 and 2. As always, I offer private one-on-one instruction for basic pistol, Chicago firearm certification, and basic home defense. For further information, please call 877-954-3030 or go to saferusa.com. Safer USA, choosing to own a firearm is your business. Teaching to own it responsibly is ours. That's 877-954-3030 or saferusa.com. You're listening to On Target Radio on AM560. The Answer with David Lombardo. Here's David with more interesting conversation on firearms, safety, your Second Amendment rights, and much more. And we're back with more On Target Radio, and we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Mike, why don't you tell us uh, real quick a little bit about Hilltop Meadows Hunt Club, what you do, and how they can get a hold of you? Well, we're a hunting preserve. We hunt uh, upland game and uh, deer, turkey, doves. Uh, coyotes also <laughs> try. But anyhow, I just want to say if anybody wants to really see what uh, good habitat can look like and what the conservation uh, reserve program can do for a piece of land, they should come and check us out. Um, they can check out my website, hilltopmeadowshuntclub.com, and they can reach me at 815-535-1056. And do you, what is the hunting season when you have a hunt club? I have a year-round license, but we kind of correlate it with the weather. We start when it gets cool, and we stop when it gets too warm. So end of March, maybe uh, beginning of April, we'll, we'll shut down. Super. I need to get out there. Come and shoot some five-stand sporting clays. We I do need, that year-round. I need to do that. I yes. really do. Uh, and then, Scott, uh, anything IDNR? Well, I guess the take-home message I would ask uh, the listeners to, to – uh, Think about how much wildlife contributes, or I think everybody, whether it be consciously or subconsciously, has a need for open space, uh, whether you have a consumptive or a non-consumptive use of natural resources or both, uh, and, and wildlife fits right into that. And so, it, you know, reaffirm its important in importance to us, to our quality of our life. And get behind a cause, whether it be a, a membership in Ducks Unlimited or Pheasants Forever. Uh, do whatever you can. A volunteer at one of the local forest preserves. The list goes on and on. And every little bit helps. And uh, keep wildlife not only for us today, but for generations behind us. And thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. And Dave Harrison, last but not least, uh, Whiteside County Soil and Conservation District. Any pithy parting words? Yes. Uh, thanks for having us on tonight. I appreciate that. Uh, I would just say if you're a private landowner out there, give us a call. Um, I'm going to give you my number, and I hope this isn't a mistake, but 815-772-2124, extension 3. And if you're looking for a soil and water district or a ID in our office, I can probably get you started in the right way. We appreciate it, gentlemen. Yep. Thank you very much uh, for, for coming on to this evening, and uh, we'll, we'd like to have you back again. You bet. One, one of the things that we talked about that we would like to set up is uh, get a conservation police officer on. Probably as you get closer to the hunting season, we can talk about uh, state law on steroids, which is what they are. Yes. Uh, we would like to uh, thank our guests, Dave Harrison, Scott Schaefer, and Mike uh, Jacobson for being with us. Um, Vicki Cohen, our uh, call screener, and George Hoffman on the board. We'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Illinois Gunworks, Pelzer Shooter Supply, Illinois State Rifle Association, our website developer, 31 Moons, and Safer USA. Next week, we have a really interesting program. Yes, we do. If uh, I don't know if you've noticed the uh, black SUVs with tinted windows parked in front of your house and mine, uh, but next week we may cinch the black uh, SUVs in our in our front of our house. We're going to talk about gun control and civil disobedience next week, and we have three pretty uh, high power attorneys who are going to be on: Vic Quilisi, uh, Ed Ronkowski, and Walter Maxim, and. Um, it's going to be a very interesting subject, gun control and civil disobedience. If you've heard of somebody's talk about uh, 
They try to take my guns. Just let them try. That's what this topic is going to be. That's what this topic is going to be. And you may you may not like it. You know, we right. don't know. But um, we are going to explore it. We're going to explore it. That's exactly right. We hear a lot of bravado. The question is: Is in reality, what does it all come down to? Who's going to be first in line, and how many people are going to line up behind them? Tim, I am behind you 100%. <laughs> iGold Wednesday. Remember to go to iGold. Absolutely. Show up for iGold. Say hi. Both Tim and I will be there. Uh, we'd love to have you come down. Uh, I know that Richard Pearson and Don Moran really want to get a big turnout. So we hope to see you in Springfield on Wednesday. Uh, otherwise, thanks for listening. Uh, say good night, Tim. Good night. And we hope you'll be back for more on Target Radio next Sunday at 9 p.m. And thanks, Mike, for making it all possible. Thanks, Mike.